So the next speaker is Bobby Payne. This is Bobby Scott Dallas. Thank you. It's a huge honor to be here uh, to help celebrate your birthday, Hiroshi. Um, as each speaker before me has said, uh, you know, Hiroshi has made tremendous contributions both to the science and the uh, people and organizations in string theory. Um, I, my memory is poor, so I can't do I can't do what Nadi said we should all do. I'm not sure when I first met Hiroshi. He was already a star in the firmament when I was in graduate did school. You, did you give you give a talk in Berkeley? I did. 1993. 1993. Perhaps I met you. Hiroshi has an exceptional memory, but it's very poor. <laughs> I, I do believe that's I met you. Your work with David. Yes, that's right. And I believe I met you at that point. And, and I have gotten to know Hiroshi gradually over the years. I'm afraid we have not yet written a paper, but perhaps in the second halves of our careers, we might uh, do this. Um, you know, I think the thing that is really special about Hiroshi is his remarkable combination of aesthetics, understanding and, and working with the beautiful, i.e. geometry, and the practical, uh, dealing with connecting to physics in, in real world and managing large systems like the Burke Center, the KIPMU. So as I've gotten to know Hiroshi better over the years, uh, he and I have both worked a lot with the ACP. He has obviously done much more there than I have, but as I've been involved with that center over the last 15 years or so, I've really been very amazed at how Hiroshi handles complicated institutional issues with such elan and grace and efficiency uh, that it's it's quite an inspiration. He really has a, a genius for dealing with complex systems, both in the physics and in the societal side. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to touch on various things that Hiroshi has worked on over the years, Calabia manifolds and mirror symmetry, which are perhaps on the beautiful side, and the landscape swampland, which is perhaps on the potentially practical side, we'll see. Um, Hiroshi said something last night about how in the late 80s, you were struck by the work of Green and Schwartz and how that suggested that maybe we would be moving rapidly towards an incorporation of the standard model into, uh, into string theory. And this talk will actually be somewhat old fashioned in the sense that um, I think most of the people in this field have sort of given up on that, but I'm still chasing the dream of connecting to uh, the standard model. So this is maybe the first, uh, except for Hiroshi's mention last night, this is perhaps uh, the first explicit mention of trying to get to the standard model. But I think it's still something that's worth pursuing. And I think we've learned a lot about geometry in the last decade or so that really gives us more powerful tools to do some exciting things. Um, so. Again, I'm going to be talking about going from geometry to 4D physics. Uh, much of the work I'm going to be describing is work that was done uh, in collaboration with and largely by this outstanding group of collaborators, Patrick Jefferson, Mankey Kim, Kobe Lee, and Andrew Turner. Um, I'll bring your attention in particular to uh, Patrick and Andrew, who are both uh, exceptional physicists who are both on the job market this fall. So I encourage you to read their folders and uh, hire them. Uh, they're, they're great. Um, so again, going back to this, the anomaly cancellation issue, some, somewhere around 2010, I was trying to understand flux compactifications in 4D and realized I really didn't have a deep enough understanding to feel confident that I had any idea what was going on in the kind of big picture. So I kind of drew back and uh, around that time uh, with Oliver DeWolf, who's here and Alan Adams, we went up to 10 dimensions and cleared out the 10D swampland. So that enabled us to move down. So then I moved to six dimensions. And uh, you know, six dimensions is interesting because it's the, low, it's the highest dimension that has matter in a, in a supersymmetric theory. Uh, so I spent actually more time than I expected uh, thinking about trying to understand the landscape of six dimensional supersymmetric uh, gravity theories. And in 2018, um, I had the privilege to speak on the occasion of one of the numerous uh, prizes that, that uh, Ogurisan has received over the years at, at the Hamburg uh, Prize. And I gave a summary more or less of some of the lessons from six dimensions for geometry, the string landscape, and the nature of matter. And since then, I've moved into four dimensions again. So the last few years, I've actually been trying to understand four-dimensional physics again. And I think about a year ago, I gave a virtual talk here at Caltech um, and I talked about some of the same themes that I'll talk about today. Uh, I apologize to people who there's a bit of overlap, but in each of the things I'll talk about for the people who were here a year ago for that, uh, I'll add some more, hopefully, progress from the last year and some new interesting things. 
And for people who weren't, I'll set it all in context. So the basic plan of the talk is I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the global picture of the 4D F theory landscape. And then I'll talk about a slightly technical math problem in understanding the middle cohomology on elliptic Calabi-Yau fourfolds, uh, which seems a little oblique, but it's actually really central to understanding chiral matter and other important aspects of 4D physics in this approach to string theory. So hopefully I'll, I'll uh, explain why we care about this, this mathematical thing. Uh, and then I'll describe a couple of new constructions of the standard model um, in, in F theory, different ways of getting uh, the standard model. And if time permits, I'll have a little interlude on another uh, question, which is sort of a spin-off of this that relates to uh, Hiroshi's work on the swampland, and I'll talk, say some things about applications of mirror symmetry. So I shunted a number of technical details and references to some extra slides at the end, so I can go to those if there are questions, or if the slides are posted, you can just look up some of those. So I'm going to be a little um, brief with, with some of the things and references, but again, ask me at the end. So, you know, the, the, the primary goals of this research program that I and collaborators are engaged in um, is to try to get a global picture of as big a piece as we can of the string theory landscape. And F-theory provides this remarkable opportunity because we have a non-perturbative picture of a huge class of models which are all connected into a connected moduli space. Reed's fantasy is realized in the context of elliptic calabi -Yau manifolds. So we really have just one landscape and we can try to understand what's going there, what's going on there. And so what the qu kind of questions we want to ask are, if we just take that top-down picture of the 4D F-theory landscape, what is typical? And one of the things we find is that a typical vacuum has a huge number of different gauge factors. This provides room for both a standard model and lots of dark matter. Uh, we also want to ask questions about what's possible or impossible? This is essentially, you know, what does string theory allow? What does it not? This is the swampland uh, kind of question that Hiroshi and others have thought about. Uh, we then want to identify different ways of getting the standard model within this landscape and then compare them. Which of them are more natural? Are some of them exponentially favored over others? Even if we can't solve the measure problem, we may be able to make sensible statements about uh, what some of these being much more uh, common than others. And what are the differences between these different constructions? So even though this landscape is vast, some structures are clearly impossible, so we can rule some things out, and other structures seem very strongly favored. So we hope to actually be able to make some useful statements here. So let me start by giving a quick overview of the F-theory landscape. I realize many of you may not have paid much attention to F-theory. Some of you may have never seen it. Some of you are maybe uh, close to experts or close to experts on this. Uh, I'm just going to say a few basic things. The idea of F theory is to take type 2B theory and put it on a geometry which is not necessarily Calabi Yau. You don't have to immediately solve um, the Einstein equations um, with supersymmetry on just the geometry. Then you add some seven brains, which enables you to put F type 2B on all kinds of compact Kähler manifolds, a much broader range of geometries. For instance, compact projective space. If you put F theory on a complex surface, you get a 6D theory. And if you put it on a, comp on a complex threefold, you get a 4D theory. Uh, in general, you, we can define an F theory model by something called a Weierstrass model, which is basically just a way of describing an elliptic vibration. That is, we have a base. And at every point in the base, we've got a little torus or elliptic fiber. Um, and this is encoding the, the axiodiliton. So basically, the axiodiliton with its SL2Z symmetry um, can be thought of as a parameter for an elliptic curve. And so we just have a set of elliptic curves over the base. And there's there are seven brains in this, which are the things that enable it to give us a supersymmetric string vacuum. And those seven brains cause singularities in the structure of this elliptic vibration. When you have a co-dimension one singularity in the base, that gives us a gauge group. And when we have a co-dimension two singularity in the base, we get matter. So there's a very natural geometric dictionary that takes us from elliptic calabi geometries to theories with gauge groups and matter. So a lot of the work in F theory starts from M theory and takes a combination of limits that gets you to type 2B. You know, you turn it into 2A and then you do a T-duality. I'm going to be taking a philosophical point of view where we really take the 2B point of view seriously. We say, okay, can we, can we think of this directly in terms of the geometry that we see in F theory, which in, in, in type 2B, which in particular means that we have a singular Calabi-Yau and not a smooth one. In M theory, you smooth it out. 
So the question that that leads us to is if we have this singular elliptic vibration, can we extract the useful physical data out of that singular structure without necessarily worrying about the resolutions? So it, historically, people have generally taken, done F theory by doing a smoothing, that is a resolution, and different resolutions of the same singular geometry give different details, but then the physics is always the same. So the idea is we want to identify the resolution independent structure, which is what governs the physics and should be really captured by the non-perturbative type 2b description. Uh, there's some other recent work uh, thinking about this from the same point of view. The thing we're going to focus on here is the intersection theory on that singular Calabi-Yau, which can be thought of as a piece of the intersection theory on the various smoothings. Um, so let me say a little bit about what we've learned from the study of 60 F theory. The global picture is there's a huge family of elliptic Calabi-Yau threefolds. Um, this, these, these, uh, they, these shield um, an angle pictures are uh, the points in the kreutzer skarka database, which is hundreds of millions of different elliptic, uh, di different Calabi-Yau threefolds realized as toric hypersurfaces. Um, there's a longstanding question, which is, is the number of Calabi-Yau manifolds in dimension three or four finite? And that question has plagued string theorists for the last three decades. Um, this is a very nice piece of work by our chess session chair, uh, Christoph Keller and Hiroshi Oguri, where they tried to find a bound on one of the Hodge numbers of a calabi threefold by using a modular bootstrap sort of approach. Um, as far as I understand, they, that has not yet worked in the sense that we don't have an actual bound from that point of view, but that's one of the few efforts I know of to really bound the space of calabi that we don't know how to bound very well. On the other hand, elliptic calabi threefolds are a finite set. There's work of, of, of Gross and Grassi, uh, Mark Gross and Antonelli Grassi, um, and more recent work on fourfolds that show that the set of topological types up to birational equivalence of elliptic calabi threefolds and fourfolds are finite. So essentially, we can make a list of elliptic calabi threefolds. It's a little harder for fourfolds. This is pretty close to being, uh, you know, related to the list. We a lot of technical work I could describe, but this is pretty close to the list of, of um, three of. Th sorry, sorry, this is the kreutzer skarka database. Looking at that, almost all of them are actually elliptic. So, uh, work uh, from the Virginia Tech group and some of our work has shown that of the calabi manifolds that are known, ninety-nine point nine or something percent are actually elliptically fibered. So almost all of them are elliptically fibered and the elliptically fibered form of finite set. The red dots here are ones that are not elliptically fibered. Uh, the second comment, which I already made, is that typical Calabi-Yau threefolds in the 60 story have these very large, rigid, or geometrically non-Higgsable gauge groups. So in this set of blue dots, these orange dots over there, which are the uh, generalized Belpezzo surfaces, are the only bases, the only elliptic calabi which do not admit uh, some kind of gauge group that's kind of forced on you. So basically, a typical 6D F theory model has a gauge group that's something like E8 to the fifth times F4 to the sixth times G2 cross SU2 to the tenth, maybe an SO8 or something thrown in there for fun. Um, but that's what a typical vacuum looks like. And you could imagine that maybe part of that is going to form the standard model, and the rest is all some kind of dark matter which gets populated in the early universe. So it's a very natural paradigm for seeing the physics that we see in, in nature. So what do we know about 4D? So I, I moved a few years ago from 60 to 40, not because we'd completely gotten rid of the swampland in 60, although I think we're reasonably close in most in, in the bulk of some large parts of the modular space. That's a whole other talk. But I, I feel like I have a good enough understanding now that we can meaningfully take those lessons and move to 4D. So it turns out in 4D, the picture is very similar. This is a, a smaller subset of the calabi fourfolds, again, from a kreutzer skarka database. Um, We've done some Monte Carlo estimates on the number of distinct bases uh, with Dave Morrison in 60. We, we counted the number of toric bases for a threefolds. There are about 65,000. We did a Monte Carlo with Enon Wong and we got about 10 to the 3,000. The Northeastern group also did some explicit constructions that gave them about 10 to the 700. Uh, more recently, we've been trying to get a more systematic handle on both the toric and non-toric non through hypersurface bases. And that's another set of work that's in progress that I could perhaps report on at another time. But we're getting a better handle on this space of 
elliptic Kalabiyev fourfolds. And the basic message is the same. There's a huge set of them, but it's finite. And these gauge factors, E8, E7, E6, F4, G2, and SU2, sorry, there should be an SU3 in there. I don't know how I missed that. Uh, that includes SU3. You'll notice this is the same list. The, the, the simply laced ones of these are the same as the ones that Natalie mentioned just a couple talks ago. Um, I think this, haven't quite talked through why that is, but uh, that's, that's, this is a very common sequence of groups that you see. But anyway, these groups are groups that are forced on you from the geometry, and they can become rigid gauge factors. Note that SU5 is not among this list. You can't have a rigid SU5 forced on you by the geometry. Okay, so what's the biggest difference between the 6D theory and the 4D theory? So the difference is that in 6D, you have one beautiful connected moduli space. So it's really just one theory. It's got a flat potential on it. In 4D, we have a superpotential and we have chiral matter and they're controlled by G flux in the language of M theory. So in order to understand the physics of 4D F theory compactifications, we need to understand the four cycles in an elliptic Calabia fourfold. And this is where this bit of math I mentioned comes in. And last year, uh, with, with Patrick Jefferson and Andrew Turner, we uh, wrote a paper where we built a sort of systematic way of thinking about this middle cohomology intersection that lets us get to chiral matter. I should add that there have been a host of there's a huge literature on chiral matter in 4D F theory models. In most cases, this has been understood by doing an explicit resolution by hand, one, one Calabi out at a time. There are a few more general results for general gauge groups. Um, but the idea here is we want to really systematize this and understand it from a more fundamental geometric point of view so that we can look at uh, and, and compare different models. So I have to say a few things about, uh, this is where I have a little bit of technical stuff on the math problem the topology of calabi man fourfolds. So the key object that we're interested in are so-called divisors. A divisor in a calabi or an algebraic variety is, is a very simple thing. It's just a co-dimension one hypersurface, which means, for instance, if you take your favorite calabi like the Quintic, it means that it's the intersection of that hypersurface with some other algebraic surface. It's just a co-dimension one thing. And for an elliptic calabi the divisors organize in a very nice way. Uh, our elliptic calabi has a section, so that gives one divisor, which is a choice of a point on each of the fibers. There are pullbacks from the base, so anytime you have a divisor on the base, you can pull it back to a divisor on the whole thing. And then there are divisors from the non-abelian carton coming from the Kodaira singularities of co-dimension one. And then there are additional abelian sections. Technically, this is from the mordell Day group, and it's mathematically a very hard problem, but we're not going to deal with them for the most part today. All right, so we're interested. I said we want to do flux, so that's a four cycle. These are two cycles, these divisors, where their Poincare duals are. So we need to look at the intersection of pairs of divisors, which define surfaces, to look at what are called vertical surfaces in this 2 2 homology or H2 2. And the vertical means it's, it's the, wet, the uh, intersection product of two divisors, basically. And fluxes in this subspace will give rise to chiral matter. So we want to systematically understand the intersection structure in this H22 vert, which is the set of surfaces that we can form in this way. So it's part of the intersection structure of the calabi fourfold. Now, there's some nice work in understanding the general structure of H4 of a, of a fourfold, which is there's a vertical part, H22. There's a horizontal part, which is essentially the mirror of the vertical part, or it has to do with deformations of the complex structure modulus. And then sometimes there's what's called the remainder part, which is kind of technically complicated, but it will enter our story later. And it's uh, not as well understood as the other parts. Brown, Brown and Watari, Green, Morris, and Plusser and others have studied that. So underlying all this, the, the intersection, there's a, there's a bilinear pairing on H4, just the intersection product, which is a unimodular intersection pairing or a, a unimodular lattice. So what we want to do is understand intersections of these surfaces so we can calculate chiral matter. So flux is basically a four cycle. There's a little perturbation on that, which I won't worry about now, which satisfies various conditions. For Poincaré invariance, the integral of the flux over certain surfaces has to vanish. To preserve the gauge symmetry that's forced on you by the choice of gauge group, you need to have some other uh, integrals vanish. And chiral matter is determined by uh, these fluxes. And so you can also write the chiral matter content in terms of G integrated over a surface. So this can be thought of as just an intersection form between 
uh, the dual of G and a surface. So we want to look at the intersection form on middle cohomology. And the basic idea here is there's this set of quadruple intersection numbers. And these are the things that people usually compute when they do a resolution. And they depend on how you resolve the geometry. They're dependent on the structure of the resolution. But they also define a matrix where we take them in pairs and they define a matrix between these pairs of surfaces. We can then define the fluxes through surfaces SIJ basically by doing linear algebra, by acting with this matrix on the flux phi, which is the Poincare dual uh, expression of the, of the G. And the fascinating thing is that when we get rid of the null space of this matrix, this matrix, which is ca capturing the inner product on H22 vertical, is independent of resolution. So even though we started with something which naively looked like it depended on the resolution, the intersection numbers, this intersection product doesn't. And this is actually the key to all the rest of the talk. I spent a little time on it because having this at our disposal allows us to do a lot of things. Um, recently, we've been looking at generalizations of this. You can conjecture that there's a general bilinear pairing that is a birational invariant. It doesn't even have to be an elliptic calabi -Yau. It could be any calabi -Yau between arbitrary cycles. Um, for all the examples, for some examples we've looked at, and for some cases where we can prove it, this seems to be true. Uh, this is more uh, ongoing work with, with Patrick and Manky Kim, who's here. Um, this is a uh, work in progress, though. If anyone knows of a counterexample, please let me know, uh, because then uh, we would like to understand that. Um, what does this thing look like? What does this uh, reduced matrix look like? Well, it turns out we can write it in a very nice way in terms of the intersection structure on the base. So these are just divisors coming from the base. This is the this is the canonical class of the base, particular uh, thing related to C1 of the base. And then there's some intersections that have to do with sigma, which is the divisor that the gauge group sits on, and the carton of the non-abelian gauge group. So if we have a non-abelian gauge group and no abelian factors, we always have this form for the matrix, and we can do a change of basis that puts it in this form. So if we solve the symmetry constraints and insist that we don't break the gauge group, then the flux is just the last column here, it comes from this blue part, and it tells us what the chiral multiplicities are. So the long and the short of that is, it gives us a sort of powerful tool for looking at a whole host of problems in F theory. So next what I'm gonna do is just talk about some applications of this tool. Uh, here's an example, bottom line is we take a general thing, look at SU5, lots of people had done this in various contexts, but from this formalism, it just pops out that it's some intersection product times, uh, and then there's some subtleties about the quantization, which I'm not gonna get into. Okay. So now I want to use this to describe two new realizations of the standard model in F theory. Uh, the first one is what I'll call the universal tune standard model uh, developed with, with uh, Patrick and Andrew and also my former student, uh, Nikhil Raghuram. Um, what do we mean by a universal? A universal F theory model is a class of Weierstrass models, which basically realizes a maximal dimensional set of models realizing all the scalar fields with a certain gauge group and a typical matter content. So for, for instance, for these groups I mentioned, there are what are called Tate models, which uh, go back to um, early work in, in the F theory um, <laughs> literature, uh, Rashadsky. Hirsch, uh, you weren't on the paper. Rashadsky, Vafa, Setov. Yeah. Um, so there are these Tate models. There's the Morrison Park model for U1s. We have a similar model, which gives you the standard model gauge group. It's pretty messy. It's pretty hard to imagine how we came up with that. We found it because Nikhil had found a model which realized a U1 with charges up to four, which as I'll discuss very briefly later, is actually remarkably hard to get any massless charges even bigger than two. Uh, that's Morrison Park gives you charges one and two. Everything else is very exotic and hard to do. But anyway, taking Nikhil's model that gave, us, gave him a U1 with charge four and unhigsing it, it turns out gives us a, a model with gauge group SU3 cross SU2 uh, cross U1 mod Z6. I seem to have neglected to leave the gauge group on in, in simplifying my slides. The gauge group we're talking about here is SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 modded out by the central Z6. And if you don't mod up in the central Z6, the whole thing looks very unnatural in F theory. So it seems like we need to have uh, the, the Z6 modded out. Okay, these are the, we get generic matter for this, includes three families of different kinds of anomaly-free matter. And so it's a little bit more messy than the standard model because we have this extra matter, but it took us about a year and we just got the paper out last week. 
We have a closed form expression for all the chiral, chiral multiplicities. It's complicated because of the extra U1 sections, uh, but we have a complete picture of that. Okay, that's a nice story. Let me tell you a totally different story about a different way of realizing the standard model, uh, which we worked out recently with my student, uh, Kobe Lee, based on a different principle, but using the same tool. There are many ways, now that we have this big picture of the landscape, there are many ways to get the standard model. We can tune it, we can tune a group or it could be rigid. We could use a gut or we could not use a gut. All four possibilities exist. Much of the work like Beasley, Heckman, Vafo, Danagi, Weinholt uh, was on tuned guts in the, uh, using SU5. Again, SU5 can't be rigid, so you have to tune it. Um, you can in principle have parts of this come, uh, the SU2 cross SU3 be rigid, but it's a diff bit difficult to make that work. What I just described was a totally tuned model, but we can also build a, a rigid group which breaks to the standard model, but you just can't do it with SU5. So what we did with Kobe was we broke E6 and E7 down by using fluxes. So remember that one of the uh, conditions, this is our relationship between the flux parameters, our matrix M, which we've discovered is resolution invariant and the fluxes, when theta on the, the I alpha means a carton and a pullback index is non-zero, it breaks a carton generator CI. So we can selectively break our gauge algebra and get a smaller gauge algebra. So we can just break E7 or E6 down to SU3 cross SU2. When doing that, we can preserve different U1 factors. Interestingly, however, uh, and this is a more recent development, um, which we uh, are, are, have worked on more recently. Um, with many of these breakings, you get exotics. And so if you want to avoid the exotics, you have to go through an intermediate SU5 and use these rather mysterious um, REM cycles that I mentioned, which are a much harder to understand part of the cohomology. We're getting a better handle on those and we have a bunch of examples. And in some ongoing work with, with Menke and Kobe, we're, we're broadening the class of those that we can understand. Uh, but we have examples where we use the REM site, we basically use the vertical flux to break uh, the standard model group to SU5, then we break the SU5 to the standard model using the REM cycle. And this is actually something which can very typically happen. And it seems like, although toric bases don't have these things uh, on rigid gauge groups, they seem to appear on non-toric bases, perhaps, typically, perhaps not, we're studying that. Um, but when we do that, we just get the standard model as the uh, if I know I've got it just a couple minutes, maybe. Three minutes. Okay. So let me see a few more things. So some of the features are um, we have a bunch of explicit examples. These things are fairly ubiquitous. So I mentioned earlier, we want to understand which realizations of the standard model are more typical. These realizations are more typical because they arise on these rigid factors, which appear ubiquitously through the landscape. E7 doesn't have its own chiral matter, but even so we get flux breaking that gives it uh, some chiral multiplicity. And very interestingly, the chiral multiplicity can very naturally be small or even three because the tadpole in general is small compared to the uh, sorry, it's compared to the number of possible cycles. So typical cycles just get one or two units of flux, if any. And so that naturally leads to small numbers through some Diophantine equations that I won't go into for the chiral multiplicity. So we can really easily get large families with chiral multiplicity three. Can't do this for E8, but there's maybe some story there. Um, so I only have a couple minutes. Let me just spend one minute each on two fun spinoffs. Well, one fun spinoff and one further statement. So uh, there's this beautiful work that Hiroshi did with, with Dan Harlow on the completeness conjecture, a completeness hypothesis showing that states with all gauge charges arise in a theory with quantum gravity. What is less clear is if we restrict to massless fields, how large can the charges of the massless fields be? And so uh, in the 2018 uh, Hamburg Prize Talk, Hiroshi, I reported in some work with Nikhil Raghuram, we'd gotten up to charge 21 in some implicit models, even though uh, only up to six had been described previously. Um, now we've been looking at this using this flux breaking mechanism, where basically we take a big complicated geometry, we turn on some flux on a G2 factor, uh, where the rigid gauge group is something like that, and we can get chiral massless charges up to 465 and vector-like light fields up to 657, um, which are kind of large numbers, but finite. And this is controlled by the tadpole. So the basic idea is that unlike in six dimensions where there's some constraint that doesn't allow you to do this, we can break to an arbitrarily, arbitrary diagonal U1 in the carton. So that's interesting. 
Last thing I want to say something about, we want to understand all of H4, not just the vertical part. So we can use mirror symmetry to study the vertical part of the mirror, and that will tell us about the horizontal part of the original Calabi Yao. So this is some work uh, with these folks, um, in particular, some, some ongoing work with uh, Patrick and Mankey, which I'll summarize. This is uh, a picture of mirror symmetry factorizing. So it turns out mirror symmetry factorizes for a wide range of toric hypersurface constructions that admit elliptic vibration in the sense that the, the fiber mirror goes to the mirror of the fiber uh, and the mirror of the base goes to a more complicated base. So for instance, the base P2 with Hodge numbers 2, 272 gives you the mirror base that looks like this, where these are E8s and these are F4s and these are G2s and these are SU2, very complicated thing. Here's a picture from the work with uh, Patrick and Andrew in 4D, where the mirror of P3 gives us a kind of a tetrahedron with four faces, where these are all various gauge groups, huge gauge group. This is the gauge group. Uh, there are exponentially many triangulations. And what we want to do now is compute that same matrix M red or H22 vert intersection form on this. And we've been working on that. Um, the original uh, M red is unimodular, so we believe that the mirror will also be unimodular. We get all this interesting structure. There are lots of pieces we understand, some pieces we are working out the understanding of that involve all kinds of interesting extra surfaces and some singularities. Uh, but I, it's a very rich story, but I neither have uh, time nor is the story complete, so let me conclude. Uh, we have a new general approach to understanding resolution independent intersection forms on this part of H4, which is key for understanding flux compactifications in chiral matter. Uh, we have general formulae for chiral matter, including for these universal standard model tuned constructions. We have some new ways of realizing the standard model through flux breaking um, and construction structure of the intersection form allows us to think about um, the other part using mirror symmetry. Uh, so let me not forget. Um, I just want to conclude by saying uh, happy birthday, Hiroshi. Otanjo uh, biomedeto, uh, Hiroshi san. And uh, thank you very much for all of your contrib contributions, both scientifically and to building our community. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Please. So, so one is, uh, I'm sure you have said it and I missed it. And what, so, what is the physical motivation that the uh, resolution? To, um, the results should be independent of resolution? Uh, Good. So the, the chiral matter certainly should be independent of right. resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say, I mean, chiral matter comes from fluxes. Mm -hmm. The fluxes are flux through cycles that only appear when you resolve it. Right. But the idea is that the resolution is not physical, right? In F theory, the, the Calabi Yau is truly singular. The seven brain, I mean, if you compactify on an extra dimension, so you're doing M theory in three dimensions, mm -hmm then there's a Coulomb branch on which you can do the resolution. But if you don't compactify on an extra dimension, there's no physics to that resolution. So really all that you have is the singular Calabi Yau. So what we are actually investigating is what is the underlying topological structure and physics of the singular Calabi Yau? And that should be independent of resolution because the resolution is unphysical. So resolution is meant to be some geometric, convenient geometric tool to calculate things. But exactly. Okay. Exactly. So the, the resolution is simply a tool, an unphysical tool to give you an answer. And the oh, answer had so better be like, independent. Like a, re a, a requirement for regularization independence and like ultra bar divergence. Exactly. Uh, the regulator is generally unphysical. Just because you do dimensional regularization doesn't mean we're in four plus epsilon like dimension. That's exactly like that. So, okay, yeah. so therefore, the physics should be independent. Now, the fact that this intersection form well, in the middle like the, uh, spring theory required motivated resolution. Or this is not the, uh, no, no string theory does not require a resolution. In fact, I would say type 2b really can most naturally be thought of in terms of non perturbative physics. And okay. the resolution is just one way of understanding what's going on with those singularities. You know, for example, you know, people do a resolution to understand, say, the SUN gauge factor on n coincident B7 brains, right? But we understand from string theory that there's an SUN gauge group or a UN, and then there's a more complicated structure of Douglas Park Schnell that, that, that Sheldon and I generalized to lower dimension of why you actually get that SUN, you know, you lose the U1 factor. It, it comes from like the B fields of type 2B. And so there's actually a 2B way of deriving that result. And, and one can even generalize that using things, you know, related to what, what Oliver and Spivak did, and more recently Jim Halverson and others have done to understand how the matter and 
which gauge group can arise from string junctions is another way of understanding these things. So there should be ways, this is what I said at the beginning, that the philosophy is we should be able to understand the singular geometry and find ways of characterizing right. the physics that don't depend on the resolution. Right. And often we do the resolution. I mean, in, in most of these calculations, I, I'm not sure I emphasized it, but um, in many of these uh, calculations, we used explicit resolutions to do a particular uh, analysis. So for instance, um, here, um, so I think in my uh, efforts to, yeah, so good. So so we use these specific resolution techniques that um, that, that Patrick and Monica, who's here, developed with Mboyo Asole and some generalization of those to do specific calculations. And basically what we, do, what we did was we found, we do lots of different resolutions and then we find they always are related by integer linear transformations. So we have, you know, in some cases we can prove it, but more generally, it's just an observation that, that we always get something invariant. Thank so, you very much. Sure. I have another question for you before we discuss this. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, are you ever looking at the uh, cohomology of the Claudio um, minus uh, the similarities? Um, because there's a way where you can restore a perfect intersection pairing by taking the cohomology of Claudio with uh, basically like a subgroup of the Okay, I'd love to discuss that actually, because in this work I mentioned with Sheldon Katz, where we were trying to derive, for instance, the, the U1 factors, it, there's some work of Douglas Park Chanel in eight dimensions that we were generalizing. We were using exactly that, like the relative cohomology and, and some perverse sheaf stuff that, that Sheldon understands and I don't. Um, but, but part of that is looking at exact sequences where you have the manifold without the singularities and then it, exactly that kind of thing. But I haven't seen or thought about in much detail how to apply that to the intersection theory we're talking about. So maybe we can okay. talk about that offline. Uh, I, I can add one thing. Uh, so when, when you are computing the middle dimensional homology, you are actually computing the, the homology complex support of strata. Mm. So in, in that regard, we're kind of dealing with the singularity dimension and important for that. Very impressive that you can find these standard models. It is good, right? Lots of them. This question may be premature, but have you thought about what are the best ways to break the remaining I thought about it, do not have a good answer. <laughs> yeah, we're moving really slowly. I mean, it took you know, <laughs> a number of years in six dimensions. Now we've got chiral matter, and we're just starting to talk more about Yukawa couplings and vector like matter and how this how you would break supersymmetry. Those are all important questions, which I hope at a future. Uh, date to be able to report on perhaps uh, at Hiroshi's 80th birthday. <laughs> Maybe one more question. Okay, uh, apologies if you said this, Wadi, but you talked about at the end some of these ridiculous large gauge groups. Yes. Is there anything special about small rank gauge groups like the standard model in this whole ensemble of vacua that you're looking at? Well, the individual clusters, these rigid clusters, are generally tend to be just like if you have an E8 factor, it can't touch anything else. There can't, or even an E7 or an E6, there can't be any other matter. So there's actually, either you just have an isolated gauge factor, which is rank at most eight, E8, or you have some intersecting gauge groups, in which case all you can have basically is G2, SO7, SU3, and SU2 can intersect each other in certain combinations. There's like five or six different pairs that can intersect. So you can get an SU2 cross SU3 intersecting that's rigid, but you can't get anything much bigger than that. You can get a G G2 cross SU2 is kind of the ubiquitous thing. Yeah, so locally there's a constraint on the size of the rank, but, that, but then you get lots of different factors. A typical vacuum, at least in some vague sense of typical, has like a dozen different clusters, some of which are just an E8, some of which are like a G2 cross SU2 or SU3 cross SU2 cross SU2 cross SU2 in some chain. There's some interesting graphs and things, but uh, yeah, you tend to get, it, it's not obvious why you would just get an SU3 cross SU2, but it is clear that you get isolated E6 and E7, and the flux breaking can easily take, I mean, if you just take something with an E6 or E7, turn on some fluxes, typically the flux will break you to something smaller, and we haven't, we're working on the statistics of that, but it seems not implausible that the, the standard model is not an atypical thing to happen when you have an E6 or E7 sitting there and you get some flux, it breaks it down to something smaller. Could be the standard model, could be, you know, something slightly different, but but those smaller, basically the typical thing is going to be, you get like an E6 or E7, you break it with fluxes and you have some rank four or five gauge group. Seems pretty, pretty not, you know, not surprising at least. Uh, I can't claim it's typical, but it's, uh, there's, there's certainly all over the place. There's 10 to the 3000 bases that had met, you know, 
lots of these things. Okay, then maybe in view of time, uh, let's set some questions. Yeah.